we prepare to hear from the Lord in preparation for faithful living in this upcoming week and days, I'm going to invite you to hear a passage of Scripture where I believe God talks and teaches to us in the book of Exodus, the second book of the Old Testament. If you would journey with me to chapter 14 in the book of Exodus, there's a word from the Lord that I want to read beginning in verse number 10. Bobby and Terrence, can I have some more volume, please? Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse number 10. I want to read out of the New King James Version of the Bible and ask those who are physically able to stand with us as together we reverence the reading of God's Word from Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse number 10. If you have neither Bible in hand nor on your smart device, the Scripture is on the screen. The Word the Lord reads, and when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt so with us, and to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you when we were in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And then the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. And so I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Today I want to talk, teach and preach about obstacles and closed doors. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The setting of Exodus 14 is familiar to just about all of us. Even if you are not consistent in church attendance and never graduated from Sunday school. If you're old school, you've seen the Ten Commandments. If you're new school and have grandchildren, you've seen Prince of Egypt. And you know what's going down in Exodus 14. As a reminder, the children of Israel have been in bondage for 430 years. 430 years of slavery in Egypt. 430 years of building pyramids without enough resource. 430 years without equal treatment. 430 years of overseers and whips. 430 years of slavery. And as if slavery were not enough, in Exodus chapter 1, we are introduced to a new pharaoh, a new king, a new ruler in Egypt who is afraid of the slaves. For he realizes that if these slaves ally with the enemies of Egypt, we will be overtaken. And so this new pharaoh with a demonic mind institutes genocide through infanticide. He sends out an edict declaring that all the Hebrew male children be killed. Because this Pharaoh has found out that if you want to eradicate a people from the earth, you attack their children. Here's how you erase a people from the earth. 
You red zone the districts and communities they live in. You target those areas for gentrification and rebuilding of properties that they can no longer afford to live in. You overpopulate their schools and underfund their education and label them as educationally unfit by the time they get to the third grade. You raise them in food deserts where there is no fresh produce and only processed food for children to eat. Then you pass a farm bill that cuts the supplemental nutrition assistance program so that the kids do not have adequate food. Then you over-police their communities and kill their children, videotape it, put it on the internet, and not indict the very ones who took their lives. Then you monetize incarceration and put black and brown bodies in jail and make it profitable for people to make money off of sending these kids to jail. Then you take the children of immigrants who know nothing other than America and send them back across the border without any assistance or family. That's how you kill a people. And there's a new pharaoh who thinks all of this is a good idea. And in the midst of this new demonic administration that's come to Egypt, <laughs> in that midst, we hear two words that ought to change your perspective. And those words are, but God. I wish I had some folk who knew the power of those two words, but God. God has orchestrated the deliverance of his people. God is going to liberate them from the hand of Pharaoh, and it all centers around a brother named Moses. Adam, Moses is unique because Moses is bicultural. Moses is born Hebrew, but he's raised Egyptian. Moses has a heart for his people, but he speaks Pharaoh's language. Moses has access to the palace. He can come in and out without being stopped. And God declares that if I'm going to deliver, I not only need some rebels outside, but I need somebody who's got access to Pharaoh inside. I need a man just like Moses. And so God meets this Moses in chapter three, in an experience through a burning bush. And he tells Moses, I have seen my, the oppression of my people, and I've heard their cries. You know how the rest of the story goes. Moses is sent back to Pharaoh with one simple message. Moses goes to Pharaoh, and in the gospel of Kevin Hart, he tells him, God told me <laughs> to tell you. <laughs> if your neighbor laughs, tell him you ain't saved. You are not saved. God told me to tell you, let my people go. Pharaoh is not moved by Moses. Pharaoh doesn't care the message that Moses brings. Pharaoh refuses to release the slaves. And so God, through Moses, enacts 10 plagues in Egypt. The purpose of the plagues was simply to assure Pharaoh and the Israelites that God was with Moses. Moses is used by God 
to initiate plague after plague after plague so that anyone who looked at Moses would know surely the hand of God is on Moses. Nine plagues don't move Pharaoh. It is only the tenth plague when the death angel sweeps through Egypt. When the Pharaoh who wanted to kill Israelite children now has the same death enacted on his family, that's when he decides to move. Because Pharaoh doesn't change until it happens to his children. Pharaoh doesn't mind deporting your children. Pharaoh doesn't mind calling your children sons of. Pharaoh doesn't mind saying you're from an s-hole country. But the minute a reporter calls his daughter out of her name, that's when Pharaoh gets upset. Uh, uh, please don't get mad, it's just Bible. I'm just preaching Bible. And so Pharaoh is moved by the 10th plague. And in chapter 12, he momentarily repeals slavery. He goes to Moses and the Hebrews, this is what he tells them in, in the Howard John Wesley translation. This is what Moses hears from Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, Mo, Y'all ain't got to go home, but you got to get out of here. And the Bible says, watch this, 600,000 Israelite men, not including women and children, follow Moses out of Egypt. As a matter of fact, what the Bible really says is that there's 600,000 the women, the children, and a mixed multitude. I need you to understand, biblical scholar, that Hebrew and Israelite are not synonymous. The Israelites were part of the Hebrews, but the Hebrew also incorporated a mixed multitude. Don't you miss this. When God opens the doors of deliverance, it's not just the Israelites he leads out, it's also a mixed multitude. Because the hand of God does not simply favor one segment of society. The hand of God operates to liberate all of those who are oppressed, all of those who are unjustly treated, all of those who are hungry, all of those who are discriminated against, all of those who are biased against. God does not just deliver y'all, he delivers all. Let me tell you why that's a good word. Because it's a sad segment of people who only want God to bring you equality while you are still complicit in the oppression of other people. How can oppressed people want to oppress other people? Don't you know the God that brings us out is the God that brings all out? That God does not discriminate who God chooses to use and to free? God says, I free all of my children. Uh, I know you don't like this. God is not either or. God is both and, both race and gender, both ethnicity and sexual identity, both education and income. You can't divide the hand of God when it comes to freeing God's people. You're meddling, Pastor, go on, move on, move on, move on. So 600,000 Israelite men, women, children, and mixed multitude, that easily means that more than a million people follow Moses out of Egypt. A million people follow one man. Why would a million people follow one man? 
Because they believe Moses is following God. A million people believe that that man is listening to God, obeying God. We've seen the plagues. We know he's convinced us God is with them. So a million people follow Moses because they believe Moses is following God. Please don't miss this. They look at Moses and believe God is with him. God is leading him. God's hand is on him. We'll follow him because God's got him. And everything is fine in the beginning of chapter 14. Oh, wait, but by the time you get to verse number 10, all hell has broken loose. In chapter 14, by the time you get to verse 10, two problems have come up. Number one, on their way out, following Moses, they hear the sound of chariots. And someone turns around and sees that Pharaoh and all of his army are now pursuing the Hebrews. Pharaoh has changed his mind. He must have met with his economic council who told him we cannot build this nation without free labor. This nation has been built on the free labor of slaves. Someone must have reminded him, without slaves, there is no Egyptian privilege. And so we've got to reclaim these slaves so that we can feel better about ourselves and think that we are better than anybody else. We've got to establish our privilege. So they're chasing after the Hebrews. A million people on foot being chased by an army in chariots. And somebody realizes this ain't going to end well. <laughs> but Madam Mayor, the bigger problem is not what's behind them. The bigger problem is what's in front of them. Because they followed Moses, they hear the chariots, and they look in front of them, and they have run up on the shore of the Red Sea. Now, now, now you know how it ends, but that's not how it begins. They get to the Red Sea, ain't no path in the middle, no bridge over troubled waters. No boats to cross over to the other side. A million folk have followed Moses, chariots behind, an impossibility in front, and they do what church folk know how to do. They complain. Tap somebody say, he's talking about you, not me. <laughs> listen, listen to what they say to Moses. They say, Mo, didn't we tell you, leave us alone in Egypt? But no, you had to bring us out here into the middle of the wilderness. Pharaoh is right behind us. We ain't got nowhere to go. Moses, you done messed up. Notice that there's no God talk in this. They don't say the Lord brought us out here. They say, Moses, you done messed up. Their realization of the Red Sea and no way to cross has caused them to doubt, is Moses really following God? Because if Moses was following God, this Red Sea would have been open. If Moses got God right, this wouldn't be happening. We followed you in good trust. You told us God was leading you. 
and now we run up and there's nothing to do. This is not how it was supposed to end. Pharaoh's about to kill us. We ain't got nowhere to go. Moses, you are not following God. Because if you were following God, this wouldn't happen. Now, I want you to put yourself in Moses' position for a moment. Pharaoh behind, complaining church folk on the side, <laughs> and a Red Sea in front. Uh, the enemy in the back, discouragers all around, and a closed Red Sea in front. And here's the dilemma Moses faces. The dilemma Moses faces is this. How do I interpret the Red Sea? Is the Red Sea a closed door? Or is the Red Sea simply an obstacle we got to get through? Come here, come here. That I've been following God and I've come upon a circumstance and I don't know is this the Lord closing the door, telling me I'm moving in the wrong direction? Or is this the Lord giving me a sign that I got to stretch my faith and push through? Amen. Come here, come here. This, this is what happens when you walk with God. You run upon situations and you don't know how to discern, is God telling me I need to move in another direction or is God telling me I need to stretch my faith and push through this thing? Is the Red Sea a closed door or an obstacle? Can I tell you what makes this difficult? What makes it difficult, Dr. Faye, is that God uses both. Let me tell you about the God I serve. He is a closed door God. That when God sees you moving in a direction that is not according to his will, when you are pursuing something that God does not desire you to have, when God wants to protect you from your own desires, God is able to close a door that you cannot open. I wish I had a witness. God knows how to shut something down. God knows how to tell you no. God knows how to make it impossible for you to go in that direction. Is there anybody here ever experienced a closed door? Uh, and let me tell you how you know the grown folk in church. The grown folk in church have experienced a closed door, but can look back at it now. And rather than get mad at God, they can give a hallelujah and a amen. Thank God that he closed that door. Thank God I didn't get what I wanted. Thank God I didn't marry that brother. Thank God I didn't get that job. Thank God for closed doors. Somebody say he'll close the door. Yeah, but God also uses obstacles. Every journey with God is not easy breezy. When you're faithful to God, God with intentionality will put obstacles in your path to teach you how to get through. God will put mountains in your way to teach you how to climb. God will put opposers and naysayers in your environment to teach you how to ignore some folk. God will put some problems in your way to teach you how to pray. 
God will use obstacles to grow you. Sometimes what you're facing is not a closed door. It's an obstacle of God telling you, baby, now ain't quitting time. Now it's time to dig your heels in and holler like Jacob. I won't let go until you bless me. God, I'm going to pray my way through. I'm going to push my way through. I'm going to fight my way through. Sometimes it's an obstacle. So how do I know the difference? How do I know if what I'm facing is God telling me I'm going in the wrong direction or God telling me push through? How do I discern the difference between closed doors and obstacles? Have I lost you yet? That rejection letter I got, is that God telling me I ought to stay at the job I have or I ought to apply somewhere else. That disappointment I'm dealing with, is that God trying to let me know that's not his will or God testing me and saying my faith needs to be greater? That trouble in the relationship, is that God telling me she ain't the one or God telling me to lay her on the altar and pray for her till she change? Uh, <clears throat> How do I know the difference? Somebody said that's a good question. Because you see, the people who were with Moses saw the Red Sea as a closed door. Moses, you messed up. That's not the direction God wants us to go in. Moses saw it as an obstacle and an opportunity to grow their faith. How does Moses discern it as an obstacle when the people see it as a closed door? How do you know the difference between an obstacle and a closed door? You're not going to like the answer. Because the answer is another question. And it's a question only you can answer honestly for yourself. The difference between an obstacle and a closed door is this. How did you get where you are? Come, 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 come here, come here, come here. The difference between an obstacle and a closed door is determined by your being honest with how you got there. Here's what Moses understands that lets him know it's an obstacle and not a closed door. Dr. Faye, Moses knows I didn't just get here by my own desire. I didn't just show up and tell y'all I'm tired, let's leave and follow me. Moses said, listen, when we left out of Egypt, there was a pillar of cloud leading us. Now, y'all didn't have discernment to understand that was the hand of God that was leading, but I was following what I discerned to be the hand of God. I didn't just get here and pray. I prayed my way here. Make sure you get this. I didn't just get here and talk to God. I've been talking to God all the way here. Look at Moses' prayer record. Moses said, listen, by the time we get to chapter 14, I've been talking to God since chapter 3. In chapter 3, God spoke to me and I heard him. In chapter 4, I obeyed God and went to Pharaoh even when I didn't want to. In chapter 5, I told God it didn't work. In chapter 6, God told me to keep on doing the daggone thing. In chapter 7, I said I need some help and God sent Aaron. I obeyed in chapter 8. I surrendered in chapter 9. I walked with him in chapter 10. I did what he wanted in chapter 12. And by the time I got here, I know I prayed my way here. So the reason I know this is an obstacle is because I didn't get here by personal desire. I got here through prayerful discernment. Beloved, the ability to determine whether you're dealing with a closed door or an obstacle is directly determined 
by how much prayer is behind you. Can you say you prayed your way to this dilemma? Now, that's a word and it gets quiet here because if the truth be told, 99% of the Red Seas we face, we get there following our own desire. Can, can I just be honest with you about you for a minute? <laughs> Every Red Sea you faced, God didn't lead you there. Touch yourself and tell yourself, that was me. That, that was me. That, that was me. So for the people, they see a closed door. Why? Because they don't have the prayer life Moses did. They've not talked to God. They've not surrendered to God. And if you don't have any moments in your past that led you here where you and God struggled with that thing, where you laid out before the Lord, where you talked to God about it, where you prayed day in and day out, when you decided I won't move until God speaks to me, if there's no prayer, it's a closed door. If you haven't talked to God about it, that heartache is God saying no. That rejection letter is God saying that's not my will. If there's no prayer, it's a closed door. But if you're like Moses and you've been talking to God from day one about him, if you've struggled with God and surrendered to something you didn't want to do, but you felt God calling you to do it, if you know that you've worn the side of your bed out praying day in and day out, if you know that you got a prayer closet after all the journey you've been on, if you know that your oil has run out from anointing yourself every day, if you have a prayer partner on speed dial that you've called so much to pray, they blocked you. <laughs> if you've prayed like that, then what you're facing is not a closed door. What you're facing is God giving you an obstacle and an opportunity for you to stretch your faith and him to show you his grace. If you know that you know that you know that prayer led you there, then hear what Moses says. It's some good advice. It's the best advice I can give you this morning. Moses tells children of Israel, listen, listen, I know y'all hear Pharaoh behind. I know you see the Red Sea in front. I know you think I messed up, but let me give you some advice. Stand still. Stand still. Stand still. That term stand still that Moses uses is the Hebrew verb yatsav. And since Judy isn't here, let me teach you what Yatsav means. Yatsav does not simply mean stand still. This Yatsav is, is not the Donnie McClurkin stand. What do you do when you've done all you can? You, no, that's not what this is. Yatsav does not mean just stand. Yatsav literally means present yourself to God and let God work on it. Yatsav means give it to the Lord. Stand in front of God. Tell God what's going on. Fall on your knees. Open your heart. Open your mind. Give it to God and let God work on it. Because when you've got danger coming and you don't know what to do in the front, here's what I promise you. You will never pray to God and God do nothing. You can never need God like that and present yourself and God do nothing. I guarantee you without fear of contradiction that if you present yourself to God, that God will do something. And this is what Moses says. I'm done. He said, listen, stand still, present yourself to the Lord and watch what happened. He said, number one, you don't have to be afraid. He says, fear not. Well, what are they afraid of? Pharaoh. In their mind, we made a wrong turn. We came up on the Red Sea, 
Pharaoh is coming. This is going to be a costly mistake. We made a wrong decision and it's going to cost us everything. The people see Pharaoh and they believe the decision to follow Moses is going to cost them their lives. Now, here's the flip side. When Moses was in prayer with God, watch this. God told Moses before they left Egypt, he said, Mo, I'm going to lead you out of Egypt. Don't trip because I'm going to change Pharaoh's mind when you get out. God had already told Moses, when I lead you out of Egypt, don't trip when you see Pharaoh coming because I'm going to change Pharaoh's mind. So when the people heard Pharaoh, they thought Moses was wrong. When Moses heard Pharaoh, he knew God was right. So Moses, so Moses says, listen, don't fear because God already knew this would happen. And even if you think we've made a mistake, God will fight your battle and God will make certain that even if it's a wrong decision, it won't cost you everything. You won't lose your life. You won't lose all your money. You won't lose the years of your life. If you present yourself to God and sincerely follow God, even when you make a bad decision, it won't cost you everything. There's no way for you to lay it all on the line with God and tell God, I just want to do what you want me to do and try to obey God. And even if you make the wrong decision, God will be certain that because your heart was sincere, it won't cost you everything. So if you choose the wrong job, don't fear you won't be on it long anyway. <laughs> if you say yes to the wrong brother, don't worry. It may not make it to the altar anyway. God says, when you stand before me and present yourself, I will shield you from the costly consequences of bad decisions. And Moses gives him a second piece of advice. He says, listen, stand still, present yourself to the Lord, fear not. And then watch this. This is the shout. He says, and see the salvation of the Lord. You know, you know, you know, you know what he says? He says, sit back and watch God be God. Watch. Well, God, now, now, now you're clapping, but I'm about to make you shout. The shout is this, when Moses gets to the Red Sea, nowhere in his conversation with God did God tell him, you're going to face the Red Sea. God never told him that the sea would be an obstacle, which means, here it is, God also never told him that a way would be made in the sea. So that when Moses gets to the Red Sea, he has no idea what God's going to do. He doesn't know when God's going to do it. He doesn't know how God's going to do it. But this is what he tells the children of Israel that I tell you, that if you trust God and put it all in God's hands, the Lord will make a way somehow. God will make a way. Hey. I don't know when he will, but I know he will. I don't know how he will, but I know he will. I don't know when God's going to do it, but God will make a way. You don't see it coming. You can't time it. You don't even know how God's going to do it. But when you present yourself to God, and stand still, the Lord will open up the rivers. And here's what God tells Moses, and it's the last piece of advice. 
Tell them to stand still, present themselves. Fear not. Watch me make a way. And then God tells Moses this. Tell the people when they see the waters beginning to open, go. Don't, don't hesitate. Don't fear. Don't worry. If you've laid it all on the line and put it in God's hands, the moment you see the Lord open the waters, go. The minute you discern that God's making a way, go. Because if you trust God with everything and you begin to follow God, even if you're moving in the wrong direction, God knows how to alter. Trust God and go. Lord, I'm not the only one who bows before you this morning having faced some Red Seas. Some of them I got there by my own. And some I got thinking I was hearing you correctly, following what you wanted me to do. And now someone stands, Lord, wondering, is this a closed door or an obstacle? So in this moment, God, we stand still. We present it all to you. Every circumstance, every causality, all the complexity. And we ask you, God, to direct our path. Lord, I'm afraid of making the wrong decision. It could cost me so much, but I believe that if I trust you, you will shield me from the cost of a bad decision. And so now, Lord, I pray for discernment for my sister, my brother, that you would open their eyes that they might see the path you're making. And the Lord says, my sister, my brother, when you see the waters open, go. When the door begins to open, push through. When you see I'm making a way, don't be afraid. Trust me. Walk down that road and watch what God will do. Fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.